It's a beautiful day to worship, amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, won't you choose it? You can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there Thank you. 
give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Echo in my
this time in our worship celebration, we turn our attention to the cross of Jesus. We reflect and we commune as a family and as individual children of God. If you did not receive communion on your way in, just go ahead and raise your hand and usher will bring you everything you need. And for our family joining us online, this is a great time to get your elements. No matter how far away it may seem, we are connected by the heart and God sees us wherever we are and we are worshiping as a family. Hope, Jesus came to a world solid in their rules and their behaviorism. And people had an idea of what things should be like. But God came to show us something else. And in his act of sacrifice, in the beauty of him giving his life for us, we find freedom. Freedom from the expectation of humans because we live for an audience of one. And as we reflect today and we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, we open our hearts that we focus on the freedom in love that was given through the body and the blood poured out for us. You are free to take communion because of the belief in your heart. There is no requirement here. That belief is what gives you the honor and the right to celebrate and commune with your family. So today, we remember and we focus on our Savior, on our friend, and our King, Jesus.
Hope Church, are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to have all of you here on the ridge. And uh, we thank you for braving the cold. It's pretty chilly this morning. And also, we're thankful for everyone who's online joining us. Thank you for tuning in. Two locations, one church. Uh, you know, I, I've been coming up with this great idea for a sci-fi novel. And what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write about this church that uh, they, they live through a, a fire and they have to leave a mountain because the whole town burns up and then slowly begin to return to rebuild. And the church doesn't miss a Sunday. And then it, uh, it, it's blessed to be able to stay at a church for a while in another town. And then it comes back up and starts growing again and is all excited. And then a virus hits, you know. And uh, I know I'm, I'm a creative guy. I'm, you know, thinking this up. This virus comes and everybody has to wear masks and like they're in a whole new world at the grocery store and everything. And, uh, and then there's fighting in the country and, and even rioting in the major cities. And, uh, well, I won't go on and on. You catch my drift. But uh, this church continues through all that. There's 25 weeks. It meets virtually online, but it's still worship and never miss a Sunday. And I don't say that to brag. I say that to give glory to God, that God blessed us to keep together. I told our team that uh, I'm inspired by their uh, flexibility. We have a saying, fast, fluid, and flexible, and I appreciate them so much. And one of the great challenges in dealing with Jesus is flexibility. Uh, when he came, uh, there were a lot of people who didn't want to change the way things were. In fact, uh, gr there's a gravitational pull of religion for behavioral conformity. And it's how we do it around here. And all organizations have a culture. All churches have a culture. Hope has a culture. Um, some places are more quiet. Some places like us can be a little louder. We like to give people freedom to worship God uninhibited because we believe God accepts all kinds of worship. But not everybody likes it the way we like it. And Maybe you've gone through changes where you went a certain way, a certain version, and then you realize, oh, this really isn't for me. Or you begin to, to not um, uh, uh, think that you, you fit all of the, the aspects of it. Maybe you're, you've left Christianity, or maybe you're thinking about leaving. Uh, and I, I just really want to try to bless you today as uh, we, we look at the teaching of Jesus and the version that Peter brings to us about what G following Jesus is all about because uh, behavior conformity can be a lot of pressure. I believe religious leaders have used it through the ages and uh, we can all fall prey to it. It's like that one church that was really quiet church. They just liked a very quiet, respectful. That's, you know, like the deacon meets you at the door. Welcome. If you catch on, you got to be quiet. And one guy showed up there and he was a more vocal worshiper. And so every now and then he would yell, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And finally the elders met and go, we got to do something about this. He's really, you know, creating a commotion. So one of the elders who's a real compassionate guy says, I'll take care of it, don't worry. So the next Sunday, sure enough, the guy's there, praise the Lord. And the, the elder goes over there and he whispers in his ear, I'm sorry, son, but we don't praise the Lord in here. You know, at the time it may have seemed right to say that. But there's times when we uh, sometimes go through an experience and we look back and, you know, you know I, I don't really agree with that. That was kind of strange that I was a part of. Maybe there was a mix of good, usually is something good. And it can be uh, perplexing uh, when you look at Jesus. You realize that he didn't come to make everybody comfortable. That he came and said some things. In fact, there was one statement we're going to look at today that he said that was paradigm shifting. Paradigm is the way you, you view things. And he's shifting it. He's giving a mind-bending statement. And we can kind of read through it and not make a big deal out of it, but it made his crowd gasp when he said it. One day while Jesus was teaching, uh, he, he made this statement. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See, there's this pressure uh, to make the rules more important than the people. And um, Jesus, when he said this, 
you know, we, two, year 2000, we might read that and go, oh, that was nice, yawn. Well, you know, give me something that applies to my life. But this was a huge shift of epic proportions, for, especially for first century Judaism, but also modern Judaism. Sa the Sabbath can be everything. One of the hallmarks that makes it different than other groups is how you keep the Sabbath. Sabbath was kept in such a way that even if you're a visitor to a home, or a foreigner living in, a, in ancient Israel, especially pre-first century, you had to keep Sabbath because that's the way everybody did it. It was like the top ten, right? The bottom line is Jesus came to tell us that people are more important than the Sabbath. But the way it had been presented and lived out it, it was that Sabbath is everything before he came. Sabbath is somehow connected to the holiness of God, so you've got to do it right. And Jesus comes along and says, you don't understand, my Father. The Sabbath uh, was not made, uh, you were not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for you. Turns out, uh, what was true of the Sabbath was true of the entire law, the rules. They became more important than the people. And religious folks in our culture struggle with it too. Religious folks have struggled with it through the ages. Modern culture, we get turned around. And let me say it in a different way in case so far you're going, I don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, Jesus' statement. And, and, and let me say it this way. Nobody has children, so there'll be somebody to play with the toys. Right? You don't have some toys laying around and say, hey, we need to have some kids so that the toys will be played with. And back then, uh, Jesus, back to Jesus' point, he, he's saying, you don't get the Father's love. The Father loves the people that he created more than his own commands. God loves you more than... God loves his own commands. In case you leave early, or in case your device goes out, by the way, don't call my phone for a couple days. I found out you're not evidently just supposed to submerge them in water. Uh, and so you'll have to reach me by uh, uh, Facebook Messenger, or you can uh, email me, stanfreitas at gmail.com for a couple days. Um, yeah, it fell out of my sweatshirt pocket into the toilet, and, and I've been trying to get it to work, but it was after I flushed, by the way, so in case your mind went there, and I just wanted to bless your brunch this morning in case somebody's at home having brunch right now. But, you know, uh, God loves you more than his rules. There's some people still who might not like hearing me say that, but they really didn't like what Jesus was bringing. Because see, he's changing everything. When you get this reversed, when somehow the most important thing is the rules, not the people, people get hurt. Religious leaders have kept this going for generations. Uh, there's probably people sitting in this room or watching online that know something about bad church experiences. Jesus dives into this dialogue. Jesus deals with this tension. He stirs things up, and eventually he's arrested and he's crucified because he just wouldn't play along with the way that the people had twisted his father's words. We're about to discover when religious leaders use the law of God to manipulate people made in the image of God, Jesus was quick to remind them that they were on the wrong side of God. This may be at the heart of what some of you have had a struggle with, with organized religion. You want Jesus, uh, but not the church. But the church is the body. You can't have the head without the body. But the body has to work on this because we can all fall into this, judging one another. That's why I like to say one rule here, Jesus. And Jesus calls us to love, not to condemn one another and pick on one another. But we still have to work on it. We all have different opinions and views. I'm hoping today that in the next few minutes that Jesus' words will penetrate our hearts and our religious paradigm so that we might understand that the love of our Heavenly Father 
specifically in Jesus' words, understand that the kingdom, the worldview, this way of life has come, and he, ha he came to introduce it. Welcome to part three of the story that should have died in Nero's Rome, but somehow it survived it. The story of Jesus of Nazareth, told by his famous apostle Simon Peter, dictated and edited by a gentleman named John Mark. John Mark traveled with Peter. Peter had preached for 30 years after being with Jesus, and now he's in prison or in house arrest, and Mark is there. And just as Luke traveled with Paul and wrote down the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke, John Mark is writing the story from Peter's lips, and he's listening to what happened. Peter's in his 50s, imprisoned in Rome. He's not going to leave the city alive, according to tradition. And so Mark, who's traveling with him, is literate. He coaxes the story out of Peter. We've got to get this down for other generations. Eventually, it becomes the gospel of Mark and joins the other gospel writings, Matthew and Luke and John, and then joins Paul's writing in the epistles and letters to churches, and James, the Lord's brother, and Jude, and John, and that becomes the New Testament. And then it's added to the Jewish Bible, the Torah, the Law, and the Prophets, and becomes what we call the Bible. But I don't want you to hear me just reading the Bible. I'm not saying the chapter and verses very much in this series, but you can read through Mark. And uh, I want you to think about it as he's being dictated. He's dictating to Mark, and Mark is writing this down, and Peter is telling this amazing story. We started off that he had this amazing, simple message, Peter would say, we didn't understand it at the time, uh, but stay with me on this journey, and you'll understand it in the end. But Jesus would say everywhere he went, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, which means you're never far, you're not far. The time has come, the wait is over, everything was building up to this moment, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Here's what I want you to do in response. I want you to repent and believe this good news. If the religion you were brought up with wasn't good news, it might be that you didn't have the original version. I want you to check out my version, Peter would say, because I saw him and I was there, and it may not have been the right version that you heard. Here's what Jesus told us everywhere he went. He wanted people to turn, to face, and embrace this new way of living this new way of relating, this new way of understanding God the Father in a personal way, this new kind of love that he was introducing to the world that's so divided. Let's go back to where we left off last week. Jesus is up in Capernaum. He's traveling around these little fishing villages. Capernaum's kind of the big city up here in the north area. Remember our map exercise? about ancient Israel, what's this body of water? Galilee. Then you have a river. What's that river? Jordan. And then you have a bigger body of water. Dead Sea. This is making some of you people want to go fish, I know. But don't fish in the Dead Sea. <laughs> so then you have, actually over here, I said over here last week, but to you it's over here, Jerusalem, 21 miles away. And Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan. Herod takes uh, John the Baptist, his cousin who baptized him, puts him in prison in the desert. Jesus goes north, and he's traveling. And here today, we come back to where he was on the north shore of Galilee. Peter knows that area, and he's got four followers. Peter would say, my brother Andrew, James, and John, I knew them. I grew up with them, and me, Peter. We came into C Capernaum, and we saw somebody we knew. And so I told Mark uh, his dad's name because there's a lot of Levi, but I told him it's the son of Alphaeus. I knew Mr. Alphaeus, and everybody knew Levi because he was a traitor. He was a tax collector, and, and, and everybody hated tax collectors. Sometimes they, they lost their families and everything. They were, they were known for what they were doing. They were ripping off their own people, and Jesus looks at him, and I'm going, I know, right, Jesus? A traitor, a traitor to his family. Everybody hates this guy. 
and Jesus begins to say something, and Peter goes, no, oh, this is going to be good, and leans in, and Jesus says, follow me. Whoa, 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 wait, Jesus. Don't, do you know who this is? You know, like one of those times when we try to explain something to God. You don't know who this is. This is Levi. He, I, his dad was a good guy, but Levi, uh, something went wrong with him, and he's way off, and you, you, can't, you can't just call anybody to be your followers. Maybe he's trying to trick him. Maybe he's trying to trick him. But then Levi gets up to follow. Like, whoa, this is getting worse minute by minute. Does Jesus have no restrictions for those who want to be his follower? And perhaps Levi said, where are we going? And Jesus says, maybe smiling, I want to go to your house. Disciples are going, this is just getting worse and worse. And so they go, and Mark, write this down. We were at Levi's house having dinner. This is wrong on so many levels. Dinner at someone's house, especially back then, was very intimate. The towns and the villages were small. Everybody knew everybody's business, and everybody knew who was at whose house, and everybody's going to know we're going into a tax collector and sinner's house, and then it gets even worse. Peter says, write this down. It wasn't just the five uh, with Levi. He had dinner at Levi's house, and many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him, and his disciples were there, and m many followed. Jesus, or Levi, invites the whole office home. Hey, put down your parchment and your pens, and, and let's close the office early. Come on over, bring your family, and bring your friends, and we're going to have dinner together. By this time, Jesus has been being shadowed by the Pharisees, the religious leaders, even up in the northern part of the country, because this guy, he's teaching something so disruptive, a new kingdom, a new kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is, uh, is so messianic, what he's claiming, that, this is, that he's bringing some kind of messianic kingdom. They go up there to Levi's house, but they don't dare go over the threshold. You weren't supposed to go in because you would be considered unclean if you ate with someone like a sinner like Levi. So they're hanging out in Levi's cul-de-sac, and they, Psst, hey, Simon, Andrew, James, somebody come out here. Somehow one of the disciples or a couple went, and they said, sneering, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Implication, why doesn't he eat with us? We're the good guys. He won't even have coffee with us. We can't get his attention. And here he is eating with the worst of the worst. Besides, he's a rabbi. He's supposed to speak on behalf of God. He should know better. Jesus hears about this conversation. He doesn't apologize. He doubles down. He says to Peter, Andrew, James, or John, go back and tell him this. I think it's, it's, there's a great deal possible that he said it in front of Levi and his guests in the house because he's there having dinner. He says, go back and tell them this. Make sure they know it is not the healthy. And, and I think they're listening, this crowd. Mark's writing it down from Peter later. So they're, they're hearing him say, I have not come for the healthy. I came, not the righteous, but the sinners. So Luke's like, you know, I've come for the sick. Luke's friends are like, he's, he's calling us all sick. And all of his friends are like, wow, this guy, this Jesus guy. And they're kind of looking at each other, and suddenly they realize they are. They do have some challenges. And somehow he wasn't offensive the way he looked at us and talked to us. Just pause this story for a second. Imagine Levi that night sitting there thinking about this. He was an embarrassment to his family, his town where he grew up. He was sitting home alone in Capernaum, considering, considering whether or not he's going to follow this, keep following Jesus. And he's thinking, what lies in the balance if I don't follow him? This is a decision to open up his heart and his life and his mind and acknowledge, uh, to use Jesus' term, I'm a sinner. I'm sick. I'm in need of forgiveness. Jesus is so honest. He doesn't shun me. 
but he still says I'm sick and he says he came for me he didn't just come for Levi he came for all of us let me ask you this and then we'll get back to the story have you have you ever asked yourself what lies in the balance if I don't follow Jesus what am I going to miss what does he have to offer I think he would say freedom and forgiveness and peace and grace and love on a different level of relationship that you've ever experienced. And you'll never know unless you step up, put one foot in front of the other and follow. Every single day of your life, there's an open invitation for you and me from the Savior to follow him. There's a kind of freedom there's a new way of life that can't be ruined by anything going on in the world around us. And we'll never know what it's like. We'll miss it unless we follow him. Back to the story. It's, it's really quick uh, being understood by the leaders that this boat rocker is trouble. On hearing uh, what the Pharisees said, uh, what Jesus said back was a shocker for them. It's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. And he says, I have not come. And that's what's kind of offensive also to Peter and James and John. Hey, wait a minute, he called us too. And he says, I came to call the sinners, not the righteous. I, 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 am I one of the sinners? And suddenly this group is all the same. They have something in common. This group that's so different has something in common. Well, he did call me. He called my brother. He called James and John. He called Levi. And everybody is a sinner. Jesus could have really said, I've never met a righteous person. I've come to call everybody to this new way of life. It's really interesting, and we can completely miss this, that in ancient times... Religions didn't seek after other religions and try to convert them. This was new from, from Jesus. I mean, pagans would conquer people, and sometimes people would grow up in their, that and become a part or assimilated. Sometimes some people were attached to the Jews. But the Jews' mission wasn't to go get people to become Jews. Jesus is active. He evangelizes. He goes after. He seeks. He calls. See, the gods back then, they were like apps, you know? You need your crops to grow, you can get an app for that, a god for that. And you need uh, your babies to grow, you can get a god for that. And you want your house not to fall down, you can get a god for that. You want to be victorious in war, you can get an app, an app for that. No problem. We got a god for everything. They didn't mind adding gods. They just didn't have the, the mind, the worldview that you replaced a world system, of, of a religious system, a faith system, and had one true God. And um, Jesus is bringing this brand new thing in history. And he's not asking them to add it to their gods. He says, I'm inviting you to leave something. I'm inviting you to abandon something. I'm inviting you to em embrace something brand new. And the reason Jesus invited Levi in and the reason he invited Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the reason that invitation is extended to you and to me, it's because the time has come. The wait is over. All the pagan religions, the other religions of the world, all the cults of the world, even Judaism, all pointed for a time when God would reveal himself in such a way that the entire world would be invited to a brand new kind of kingdom a kingdom of the heart, a kingdom of the conscience, a, a kingdom that's near, which means you're not far. You've got one turn away to make or one decision away or one shift in your mindset to repent, turn from, not just turn from bad or turn from sin or turn from selfish ways, turn to something awesome, God and God's kingdom and believe more than intellectually acknowledge embrace this way of life this new life that Jesus is pursuing sinners to let them be a part of it was his pursuit of the unrighteous that illustrated this revolutionary nature of the kingdom of God 
You didn't have to be born in a certain part of the world. You didn't have to understand certain customs. You didn't have to speak certain languages. You didn't have to have specific heritage. Everyone is invited. And he went out of his way to invite people in. He went out to invite people in. Then Peter has Mark record two metaphors to help us understand the contrast of what Jesus is bringing. Torn cloth and burst wineskins. Torn cloth and burst wineskins. I want to make sure you understand the newness and the uniqueness of my message, Jesus said. I've got, I did not come to just tweak something. I've come to replace everything. For example, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Everybody knew that. Clothes were valuable. You didn't buy new clothes all the time and get rid of clothes all the time. If they got ripped, you had to patch them up ancient times they they all did that they knew exactly the point you, you your unshrunk patch would pull away from the old garment and it would tear it and be worse and no one jesus says pours new wine into old wine skins the old wine skins are stretched already they're old they're brittle and he says otherwise he tells them again it's something they all knew the wine will burst the skins of both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Well, we already know that too. What is your point, Jesus? This is so powerful. This is so powerful. This new teaching, this unique brand, new, unique worldview, this new wine message of Jesus was the new cloth and the new wine the mental image of torn cloth, the burst wineskins drives home the impossibility of trying to blend Jesus' new message with a current cultural system, in their case, first century Judaism, in our case, the kingdom of the world, the way the worldview is of those outside of Christ. I have not come to blend anything. You cannot add what I'm teaching onto what you already have. You cannot pour what I'm teaching into the container you've already developed. It's, it's all new. That makes crystal clear the futility of attempting to blend Jesus' worldview and his values with the system of Rome, with the values of the world, the kingdom of Rome, the kingdoms of this world. I'm introducing something completely new. What I'm teaching won't fit in your old context. This is brand new teaching, a brand new movement. My new ecclesia, which is the word that meant a called out assembly that he came to use for his called out ones, called out of the old way to become in this new ecclesia, his church. He replaced it with a new, it's a new wineskin. And if you're in the church you're it. You're the container. You're part of that container. That's Paul would write later uh, that we're vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're con the container that he talked about. We have to be flexible for this new wine, this new message that comes from Jesus, this new context, this new framework. Peter's a storyteller. Fishermen are storytellers. They tell story after story. And uh, it's another Sabbath co controversy. Again, underscores the incompatibility of Jesus' teaching and current models. Jesus goes into a synagogue, still up in Capernaum, it looks like. A man was there with a shriveled hand. Somet somehow he'd had some kind of atrophy, perhaps broken his hand or broken the bones, broken the fingers, and it wasn't set right or wasn't set, and it shriveled may have had some kind of sleeve but it was visible it was noticeable it's very embarrassing for this guy people are probably uncomfortable around him sometimes and jesus and him somehow connect have i connect somehow the guy's uh making a plea maybe he said hey when the sabbath is over could you help me out maybe he's heard the stories of jesus healing like the leper and people in the synagogue knew this man Peter says I'll never forget this I knew some of them and some of them 
were so mean. I, I knew these people. I had no idea how cruel they could be. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So that they watched him closely to see if he'd heal the man on the Sabbath. Now I get the idea almost Jesus goes out of his way to do these kinds of things on the Sabbath on purpose to rock the boat. Jesus shakes up church. They're used to it in a certain way. And, and he's going he's gonna to shake it up a little bit. And people are all wondering about, you know, uh, will he do it? Will he do it? And Jesus looks at the man and he says, stand up in front of everyone. Like, what? It's like, we're going to talk more about this next week. Don't miss next week. But it's like these kind of details confirm that nobody made this up. Mark's like, do you want me to write that down? Peter's like, yeah, I'm telling you what happened. Jesus called him out in front of the whole worship group. Oh, no. And Jesus turns to the audience, especially the Pharisees in the crowd, which is lawful on the Sabbath. He knew their minds. He knew their hearts. To do good or to, to, to do evil? Easy question, real trick question. But what, what, what was God's purpose in giving us the law is what he wants them to think about. Why did God give us his rules is what he's dealing with. Is it to preserve the rules? Is that what our mission is? To go and preserve and honor the rules? Or is it something else? They're all quiet. Pharisees, you know, you've got to understand a pop quiz is a nightmare because they don't want to be wrong. He, he, he adds to it. He says to save a life or to kill it. And it may be literal that he means this. Maybe this guy couldn't work. Maybe nobody would hire him. Maybe he really is starving to death. We don't know. But he's asking this question that they should be able to answer. It's so obvious. What he's really asking is the law of God for the benefit of God. Some church rules, you, you maybe have asked, does God really care about this? Is this for God's benefit? Jesus is making a huge paradigm shift. Are the laws for the benefit of God or for the benefit of those that God loves? If they are the benefit for the benefit that for those that God loves, then people take precedent over the laws. Children aren't for the toys. The toys are for the children. What's the permissible on this Sabbath? To do evil or to heal and kill? Like children listening to a parent. You've had these questions before similar questions from a mom or a dad or authority in your life, someone who asks you a question that with obvious answer, but if you say the answer, you'll incriminate yourself because you're doing something wrong. So you pout and don't answer. That's what's going on. They don't want to answer the obvious question because if they do it, it's going to change their whole system, the way they operate. They're going to be accountable to their own words if they answer that. Mark's like, what did they say? Peter says, they didn't say anything. They just stared. How does Jesus respond? If you're considering Christianity, how does your heavenly Father respond to people who apply God's law in such a way that it hurts those that God loves? How does Jesus respond when religious leaders use the law of God to hurt people made in the image of God? He looked around in anger. This word anger in the original text means wrath the wrath of jesus what is the wrath of jesus about is it about sinners who do dumb things and make mistakes who are beat up and broken the wrath of jesus is about religious people who don't care about people they care more about their rules and their church system than the people they got the whole thing backwards he's angry because religious leaders use his father's words in such a way that they were elevated over the people his father loved. And he goes on. He says he looked around at them in anger and he was deeply distressed at their stubborn heart. They wouldn't even acknowledge what they knew to be true. They had no flexibility. Peter said, and then it happened, 
he said to the man, stretch your hand. He stretched out his hand and was completely restored. The response of the Pharisees is so over the top in our way of thinking, but it made perfect sense to them because they could see what we miss. Peter tells Mark, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Wait, hang on, man. Just you know, run him out of town. Arrest him. Send him back home. You can't murder a rabbi because he healed on the Sabbath. They understood what's easy for us to miss. There's no way to blend. There's no way to take what Jesus is bringing and blend it with the old system. Religious people have tried to do it ever since. There's no way to blend what they're trying to preserve with the kingdom Jesus has come to establish. The kingdom mindset would not blend with the view of God that they were trying to so desperately to defend. He had come to reverse the order of just about everything. <laughs> the Sabbath, the law, the rules. God gave those for the benefit of mankind, not the Sabbath for its benefit. God is a good parent. He loves you more than he loves his own rules, even the Big Ten. Peter goes on. He drags us through another couple of narratives. All of this is happening at the top of the Sea of Galilee, and then the strangest thing happens. His mom, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers come there. They're, they're outside. They come to the house. Jesus is in this house teaching away. They're not even having time to eat right now. They're so busy in ministry. And Mark records something that's humorous. Mark, Mark records something that his mom says. And it's one of those things, again, I hope you come next week. We're going to deal with this a little bit more. But it's one of those things that you wouldn't write in the Bible if you're trying to show everything's perfect. It shows the humanity. His mom, Mary, you know what she says says to her about her son? She says, he's out of his mind. Maybe some of you moms have said that to one of your kids. That, that boy is, is crazy right now. This doesn't look good for Mary. This doesn't look good for Jesus. Why is it in Mark? Because it happened. They didn't pull any punches. They didn't sand off the rough edges. Peter says, I know, I couldn't believe it, and we'll pick up that story next time right there in part four uh, of You're Not Far. But for now, I want to end today with two important takeaways. One, if you're a sinner, and you are, and so am I, if you're a sinner, you are invited to follow Jesus beginning today from wherever you find yourself this is the lesson if you're a sinner somebody who will acknowledge like Levi yeah something's wrong in me something's up with me I don't know why I am the way I am and I do the things I know I don't want to do and don't do the things I should I fall short even from my own standard let alone God's I can't dig myself out of my own hole I can't be the husband I swore I'd be. I can't be the wife I want to be. I can't be the parent I want to be. I can't show respect and honor to my parents like I should. I just can't seem to control my mouth. I can't stop gossiping. I'm such a glutton. I just, whatever it is, fill in the blank. I've got this brokenness and I need help. I need a power greater than myself. And the invitation is wide open to you and to me to begin today from wherever we are to follow Jesus, seeking Jesus out, and, it, and he's, inviting, he's inviting you to take a step to follow him. Secondly, if you're already a believer and already been following, let's yield, keep yielding to Jesus. Even when his will collides with our will, let's yield to his will. The great thing, uh, we're not saying yes to a list of rules. We're saying yes to a person. We're get, not getting a relig religion, but a relationship uh, with the creator of the universe. And so it's worth turning towards his kingdom, repenting, 
and believing, replacing our old mindset with the way of the kingdom, embracing it. He's inviting us today to follow this whole new worldview, a different way of life, a, a way of life that a, that a virus or, or warring and violence in the world, nothing can take away the joy that's found in this everlasting kingdom. Nobody can steal it. Nobody can destroy it. It's invisible. It's in the hearts of men and women, disciples following. Everyone's invited, all kinds of people, and he's got one rule, love. Love God, love people, that's the standard. If you're not here to love, find another church. If you're looking for a perfect church, this isn't the one for you. Move on, and when you get to the next one, it won't be perfect either. But if you want to come and be follower in the kingdom of God, open your heart today. Jesus loves everybody. You know what's cool? Levi eventually writes Matthew, the book of Matthew. We know him as Matthew. It's the same guy, Levi and Matthew. He writes his gospel. He's got a staff of people, scribes, and they write an awesome gospel that has unique things in it that are, make it different. And one day, uh, Jesus was teaching something, and Matthew wrote it down. And I wonder if he did it because he was thinking about his own background when he was called. He says, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Anybody here know what it's like to be weary or burdened? He says, take my yoke upon you. A yoke in that day was considered uh, the, the rabbi's way of life and teaching. We think of it as a farm animal, and it's a good illustration. Hook up with me because Jesus does make the, light, the, the load life. He takes the load. But really, in the first century mind, the yoke was the rabbi's yoke. And Jesus says, don't take the yoke of these Pharisees, these people that are oppressing you and manipulating and guilt tripping you. Take my yoke, take my way of life, take my teaching upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find deep, deep rest, deep down in your soul, soul rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is for all of us. Anybody here feeling weary or burdened today, you can come to the, this rabbi and take his yoke, and you can find rest for your soul. Be open to a whole new way. Be open to be that new wine skin for the new wine to come into your life. To be you're that container that carries around his love, and you're a part of that whole new kingdom that he came. Because something is near. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. You're not far. Face it and embrace it. And don't miss next week. Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you for this incredible kingdom that you let us come in because this world can be scary. As human beings, we face fears and doubts, attacks, difficult circumstances. And you bring us into this kingdom of love and joy and in its eternal kingdom. But you don't want us just to try to acknowledge it like fire insurance. You want us to open up our heart and our mind for you and to follow. That's why you use that word follow all the time. Help us to follow, to take one step today from wherever we are to follow Jesus. We pray in his name, amen. Let's stand and worship God.
Hey, Dana, what's some next steps that people can check out? Well, if you go to our website at hopechurchparadise.com, you're going to find all kinds of information. But the thing that I'm the most excited about is our growth groups. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and we also have a men's group uh, that started up. That's on when? Our men's group, Monday nights at 630. Oh, 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 oh. And are, are gnome, gnomes allowed to go to that? Yeah. Male gnomes are allowed to go. Uh, yeah, we have a few gnomes, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, our groups will discuss the stuff that we uh, talk about on Sunday. So it's a chance for you to take it from your mind and you talk about it, not just me talking about it. So I hope you'll check that out. The men's group's always very open and great discussion, and, and Mike draws people out in that. So uh, Also, a couple weeks. Yep. February 6th, Saturday, February 6th, will be Men's Breakfast. There you go. At 8 a.m. here at the Hope Campus. Mike always brings it. His philosophy is if you cook it, they will come. And uh, he, he just brings it. So, guys, you'll love that. Um, and then also Thursdays, I do a lifter, which is a shorter video. I try to be shorter than my Sunday message. And uh, it, the purpose is to lift you up from God's Word. That's on Thursday on Facebook. And you can 
tune into that. I try to do it around noon, but, you know, give or take. So I hope you'll, you'll check that out. Anything else? I think that's it. All right, now it's time to pray for our offering. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, thank you for answering our prayer to be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory. We pray that you are glorified and honored. That's our only aim. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before we give and celebrate our last song, what is our purpose? relationships that last forever how do we do that love god love people so remember every single day this week in christ we always have hope thanks for being here joined us today.